Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Horus Heresy Lord Breakdown. We are now on book number 17, The Outcast Dead by Graham McNeil. A bit of an odd book, this one. A little bit comparable to The Battle for the Abyss, really, in that it seems somewhat disconnected from the Horus Heresy storyline as a whole. It just... it doesn't quite really fit. And whilst there are a lot of interesting little tidbits of information that can be found throughout the book, and one tidbit in particular, but the book overall feels kind of pointless in a way. It is as if this entire book exists for essentially about a page's worth of information and the rest is almost completely superfluous. I'm not a huge fan of this one. Graham McNeil has made some damn good books, but I would probably think this to be one of his weakest ones, honestly. And I don't know how much we can really blame Graham for that, or whether or not he was simply ordered to write this story. He makes the best of it, it feels like, but again, it is just... It is a book that I do not believe actually needed to exist, and it could potentially, like, the setting itself could have been done better. There could have been a little bit more of an organized focus on it. I don't know, maybe, maybe a different set of interesting characters, a bit more of a, a view from the captive space marines, perhaps. Or maybe even take it from a little bit of an outside view, looking in. A deep dive into some of the politics and the day-to-day -day activities of the Empire and the Psychers as a large collective entity during these early days of the Horus Heresy. But, of course, hindsight is always 2020, and it is far too easy to sit here judging years after the book's release. Uh, and I am on my third reading of this by now, so I might be being a little bit over-analytical, perhaps. Anywho, let us get into it. We are first introduced to our uh, two proper main characters, I suppose. There are a fair few more of them, but the most important one is by far Kai Zulan. He is an astropath who has undergone a rather traumatic experience, and due to a part of information that we will not know about for quite some time yet, his recovery is of paramount importance to the Imperium. And so despite the fact that his... Uh, Usefulness as an astropath is more or less zero at this point due to his traumatic experience. He is nevertheless allowed to undergo a very potentially lengthy and expensive retraining program. A chance that uh, very few non-functional astropaths would ever receive. There's a little bit of a mystery surrounding him, a mystery that will be slowly but surely unraveled over the course of the book. Another character we run into early is Roxanne, who is wandering uh, alone and unguarded without any form of protection through the streets of this vast imperial palace, the city that has grown up in and around it, while she is carrying a huge amount of money to buy medicine for a pair of sick children. So... Pretty lady, nice clothes, lots of money, through the slums. Yeah, the, the next step is rather obvious there, as she gets bounced by a group of thugs who then uh, go on with their thugging ways, wishing to steal her money, of course, and uh, rape and kill her, because um, apparently the lawless gangs that rule these slum areas are uh, not, uh, not the nice sort. These thugs are in the employ of a particularly vile gangster by the name of the Babu, which we will also hear a fair bit more about, despite his somewhat ridiculous name. Unfortunately for Roxanne, she is not about to be raped and murdered in a dark back alley, for she is a psyker, and proceeds to fry all of their brains to the point that their grey matter starts leaking out through their ears and nostrils, unsurprisingly ending with their uh, somewhat messy death. 
She realizes immediately that, well, uh, she isn't raped, which is good, but on the other hand, she has also killed a bunch of the Babu's men, and uh, apparently he is not the forgiving sort. She is also a part of a church, a little cult-like organization, although referring to it in those religious terms would be somewhat contrary to what the organization itself views itself as, the Temple of Woe. It isn't really so much a religious place of worship as it is a graveyard, kind of? It offers burial and mourning services, and also um, charity and aid to the poor and the sick. A worthwhile endeavor, certainly down here in the slums, but um, the Babu, Roxanne believes, is unlikely to be like, ah, oh, well, they have a charity. I, I shouldn't kill all of them and use their skins to decorate my yurt, which is uh, apparently something he has a bit of a habit of. And so there we have our first two main characters, a defective astropath and a, well, de facto rogue psyker that has just pissed off the boss of a major, indeed not even just major, but um, the criminal syndicate in the slums. Good start, good start. And speaking of optimistic portents, we also hear from a person who is at the locust of all astropathic communication within the Imperium. He is, of course, very, very busy at the moment, and indeed the Imperium is pushed to the very limits of its capacity to decipher all of the messages coming in. You know, things like, help, help, being invaded, please send help. And uh, just requests for generalized information. What the fuck is going on? Why is the nearby system suddenly spiky and shouting blood for the blood god? Can we get some assistance over here? And why the hell is the War Master apparently going berserk across half the galaxy. And of course, also overloaded by the efforts to send out astropathic communications. Rogel Dorn essentially trying to marshal an entire galaxy to resist this um, burgeoning civil war. And of course, trying to figure out who is still on his side and uh, who is not. Plus, they are also engaged in a sort of code-breaking arms race with the rebels, trying to see if there are any potential ciphers or hints or codes embedded in otherwise innocuous messages that may be intercepted by the War Master's agents on Terra and used to communicate with the traitors. It, uh, it does sound rather difficult, and apparently astropaths are burning out at a near unprecedented rate. It doesn't really help either, then, that um, Terra has been isolated from a lot of the worlds it used to bring its new astropathic recruits from. It's a little bit of a shit show. However, our little astropath in question is rather intrigued, for he has started to see a pattern in all of the communications that pass through the Imperium, some kind of cipher that he is attempting to figure out, because he is convinced that there is some great secret at work here, and well, <laughs> there is. Additionally, he is also having a lot of trouble figuring out what the hell is going on, because all of his ideas, all of his uh, message views, his, his greater analysis. So basically his job is to look over every single message and then look for traces of psychic residue to peer into the past and future. However, he isn't finding anything that makes sense. He's only finding references to ancient nonsense, speaking of gods and demons and such on. <laughs> See, I definitely get the argument that maybe if the Emperor had told people a bit more about the Immaterium and the Warp, they may have been able to help, but simultaneously I do also believe that that kind of knowledge does corrupt just in and of itself. An interesting topic for discussion, that, mind you. Anywho, this is certainly a fascinating little look into the Civil War, how the Imperium has been caught completely by surprise, and is now scrambling to see what they can figure out, what they can piece together, what they can establish, and also trying to scry the future and the past, seeing if they can't maybe come up with a solution to all of this. And this is, of course, where uh, Kai becomes rather instrumental as well, though he does not know it yet. 
And speaking of secrets, Lorgar's good book, the Lectitio Divinitatis, has also made its way to Terra. In fact, it appears to be somewhat commonplace, actually. A copy of the pamphlet is handed out in the Temple of Woe, and the staff's reaction is just, you know, it's the usual, suggesting that it's happening all the time that these pamphlets are being handed out, despite the master of the temple having put in place a ban on such subject matter. It would appear that uh, Lorgar's word is as convincing as always. <laughs> it's, it's always a slightly amusing thing to me that if Lorgar had simply just kept his mouth shut and played the long game, introducing his thoughts and ideas of the God Emperor through the lower classes, he probably would have ended up in a position where his ideas would be far more mainstream than he could ever have imagined. Unfortunately for Lorgar, the uh, long game was not really an option after the whole uh, you know, monarchia thing and all that. But returning to the present day, Kai Zulan is undergoing some retraining, some rather harsh retraining as well. This is one of the better points in the books, the mystery surrounding Kai, what is haunting him, what it is, why it's so important, why everybody's trying to figure out what it is, etc. And it's presented in a very fascinating way. The, the Argo, the ship that got destroyed in the warp and suffered a horrible, horrible fate, is painted almost like a monster in Kai Zolan's head, and I mean, to be fair, it probably is about as close to a monster as you will get for a psyker, and it keeps a, a nice deal of mystery. The main thrust of the book is paced out quite nicely along the with the fate of the Argo. It's just, again, at the end of the day, the thing you learn is cool and all, and getting there was interesting, but um, it, it, uh, anyways, I'm actually going to wait until the end before I spoil that, because uh, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit better like that, I think. Anywho, Kai is receiving the best care he can possibly get in trying to fix his broken mind, although uh, his, his mind is almost re-shattered from the attempt at fixing it, but hey, details. One cannot make an omelette without crushing a few psychers, after all, and we also get a fascinating description of the Astronomicon, which already at this early point in the Imperium's history is... A nasty place. They refer to it as the Hollow Mountain, and information as to what goes on in there is presumably suppressed, although it's not like a, a complete secret, because Kai's teacher knows of it, and has indeed seen it happen, and uses it to uh, scare him straight just a little bit. Apparently the Astronomicon at this point basically feeds on every part of a human, mentioning specifically emotion. That's rather fascinating. Now, already that means that the Astronomicon is a warp-born entity because it feeds off emotion. Perhaps it is even suggesting that the Astronomicon itself may be a warp entity. Hmm. Intriguing theory. But somewhat besides the point of what we're currently talking about. At this point, Babu de Karl's men has decided to pay a visit to the Temple of Woe, but it's one of those plot points that kind of happens and then stops and does something else for a while, so we'll get back to that in a little bit. For now, the Astropathic Choir is starting to receive new messages, or not messages necessarily, but premonitions. Kai Zelane's teacher has received a very strange one that seems to suggest that the Retribution fleet, dispatched to bring Horus Lupercal to justice, may be running into some uh, considerable problems. Disastrous problems, in fact. The visions speak of Ferris Manus making a futile attempt upon the enemy and yet coming up short despite deploying all of his considerable might. It speaks of the victory of Horus in a um, subtle veiled fashion. Unfortunately for the Imperium, it takes far too long to properly decipher the message, and even if it was properly deciphered, uh, well, 
You would have believed them. We'll get back to this again in a little bit, how it has been deciphered and how Dawn reacted to it, but now let's do the whole thing in the Temple of Vo, shall we? Babu de Carl's men show up to violate Roxanne in every conceivably poetically horrifying fashion to teach her a little bit of a lesson for her uh, crimes against the Babu's men. And they are led by a particularly large and vicious brute, which... <laughs> it's, it is um, quite clearly telegraphed that he is not human, but it's not quite so clear what he actually is. We have been told about Migu laborers previously, these kind of uh, special made mutants, massive creatures, although they do give a couple of um, overly obvious hints, I think, like the ginormous pistol with a golden aquila stamped on it. There aren't that many forces in the galaxy that use those, never mind being able to actually fire them. However, the temple is saved by the emergence of a psychic phenomenon, reducing seven out of the eight men to little more than mutilated corpses. The last guy, the big guy, makes a quick retreat, realizing that though he may be large, he shouldn't fuck too much with psychic powers, especially not when he doesn't quite know what he's up against. A wise move, certainly, which leaves the Temple of Woe standing for one more day, and with a brand new area of mystique to it. Apparently, the uh, faceless angel, a large stone statue placed in the temple, the centre of not necessarily worship, but attention perhaps, well, it is certainly going to be the centre of worship after this. And now we get a little bit of a break from our uh, proper main characters to move on to a Waponese person by the name of Nagasena, a hunter slash assassin, kind of? Uh, he's, he's a little bit of a strange one, I feel invented more because cool rather than necessarily a great deal of making sense, but uh, nevertheless he is indeed awesome, and he is actually genuinely Waponese apparently even going so far as to use actual Japanese words in some of his recollections, which is vaguely amazing because that language should have been dead for quite some time at this point, but oh well, I guess this makes him into some kind of ninja slash samurai hybrid, I guess. Again, more cool than necessarily sense, but oh well. He is having a premonition as well, just as news arrives in the uh, Imperial Palace that the Retribution Force has suffered heavy casualties and indeed been, to some extent, outright slaughtered on Istvarn, he paints a picture. And in the picture, he sees the ill tidings. He sees the future, a dark future. And from this, he surmises that Horus is going to be a much bigger threat than anyone had ever anticipated. Which is pretty impressive for just a painting, honestly, so good job. What need does the Imperium have of astropaths and such nonsense? <laughs> Again, maybe he's a low-level psycho or something, entirely possible. A psycho able to predict the future to some degree via painting? Yeah, that's not the craziest thing I've ever heard. But he understands now that uh, if the Imperium is indeed going to be thrust into a world of darkness, that he's going to have to get ready for the hunt. As to what he will be hunting, well... Even he himself does not know quite yet, but uh, I think we're already starting to develop a little bit of a suspicion, are we not? And speaking about suspicious people, our two main characters are given new revelations as well. Roxanne is revealed to be a navigator, which explains how she could turn people's brains into goop and have them leak out through their ears. And not just any navigator, but the navigator aboard the Argo. The very same ship that our little astropath was also aboard. 
Things are getting interesting, especially as Kai also is engaging in a little bit of dreaming when the impossible happens. He is just dreaming, he's not in an astropathic state or anything like that, and yet all of a sudden he sees what appears to be another person inside of his dream. And as Kai quickly tells us, this is supposed to be an impossibility. Or at the very least, the last person who was supposedly able to do this died thousands of years ago. And it would have to be an incredibly powerful psyker. <laughs> non, uh, non too subtle a hint there. And when this person also tells Kai that the human mind is fickle, but there is no great feat in showing him a glimpse of old Earth from the person's own memory. Well, uh, the author isn't exactly trying to hide it, now is he? And when this mysterious stranger also starts using terms like uh, having his thread cut, the saga masters of the ages, etc., yeah. Kaiserlan even implies it quite clearly as well that this is probably the Emperor who has shown up to, uh, well, tell them something, presumably. The Emperor claims that Kai will be there at the moment when this unknown individual, Horus most likely, is brought before the Emperor when the Emperor's thread is in danger of being cut. And the Emperor himself isn't entirely sure as to why just yet. He does also mention the, uh, the Seers of the Eldar, which I found intriguing. Now, the fact that the Emperor knows about the Eldar is not surprising at all. The fact that he knows about their Seers is not surprising at all. But the fact that he knows enough about them to state with seemingly a great deal of confidence that they have not foreseen this... That's quite interesting, because they haven't. Well, Eldred Ulthwan has, or at, le at least he has seen outlines of what is to come, but the others? They are sadly quite blind. Then again, considering the average Eldar act of diplomacy, perhaps that is for the better. <laughs> they did kind of push Fulgrim in the <laughs> wrong direction after all. That still leaves, of course, the question as to how Kai has gotten to this information, but that is yet still a mystery. What is not a mystery any longer, however, is that the Imperial forces on Istvan have suffered heavy casualties. The precise extent of it is still a little bit unknown, but unfortunately the vision suggesting that Horus might be... Uh, laughing in the form of a raven turn out to be quite correct indeed. Dawn, unsurprisingly, is rather miffed by the fact that uh, nobody told him <laughs> about this. He's, he's throwing his rage about a little bit um, unnecessarily. He's, he's very pissed with the astropaths, which is somewhat unfair because they couldn't really no, because, uh, well, they're not actually proper fortune tellers or anything, but, you know, Dawn does need somebody to yell at, and uh, they just so happen to be closest, so why not? However, in the effort to confirm the reports and make sure just exactly what has happened and the extent of the casualties, Dawn is pushing the astropathic choir to the absolute breaking point, with dozens burning out every session, even with a few um, catastrophic overloads, which is suggested that they were dealt with, or he suggested flat out stated, that they were dealt with by the Black Sentinels and that their rooms were cleansed with fire afterwards. Yes, I think I can imagine what kind of an overload we're talking about here. On the bright side, the great pattern is becoming clearer. There is talk about a great red eye, which initially is assumed to be Horus, because, well, his symbol is kind of a big red eye, so that seems obvious. However, the guy who's looking for the pattern thinks that that is too obvious. He believes that the eye might refer to Magnus, and that the dire portents is signifying Magnus's arrival on Terra very, very soon. Which again, considering what we know, is prophetic indeed, but sadly, no one listens to the old coot. They simply tell him that his great pattern does not exist, that it is all in his imagination. 
Oh, if only we listened to the imaginations of crazy people more often. A lot of shit could probably have been averted. Or created. One out of two, round about equal odds. But the crazy person who has seen a pattern in every single astropathic communication in the Imperium's history is about to be proven entirely correct. When Kai Zulan comes to him to learn about the ancient psychers that could walk through dreams, he is told uh, quite the horror story of how they essentially dominated the old states that were around during Earth's history at that time, and turned them against one another, a handful of individuals guiding the fate of the entire planet. And not just that, these creatures were also able to make any human do anything whatsoever, no matter how repulsive or against the nature of that individual person. They could force you to do anything. Now, how much of this has been embellished throughout history is of course difficult to tell, but it does remind us at least a little bit of a certain other individual who has the ability to enter into people's dreams. Though, the Emperor does not appear to have the possibility to just force people to do things, at least. Uh, there is also mention of a golden-eyed warrior, which may be a reference to the Emperor, who actually fought against the Cognizants, the super-powerful psychers, and supposedly defeated them, only to then disappear from the world stage once more. The Emperor back then being a very different character than now, as he seemed to think that it would be better to interfere with humanity only when absolutely necessary, and otherwise keep himself back in the shadows. He uh, changed his mind after the fall of the Great Human Federation, which was undone essentially by their lack of understanding about the warp, the immaterium, chaos, and so on, figuring that he required a far more hands-on approach. Whether or not this is suggesting that the Emperor was a cognizant, kind of? Like, something akin to one, perhaps, but then again, we have, like, three or four different theories on what the Emperor is at this point. Everything from the combined psyche of thousands of ancient Earth shamans, to a perpetual, to a cognizance, to just a really powerful psyker, and so on and so on. But Kaizolan's dream is the last hint of the Great Puzzle, another image of the Great Red Eye of Magnus, and this happens just as Magnus with all good intentions in mind, pops up on Terra and destroys the Emperor's attempt to create an Imperial Webway. An achievement that might have ended the Horus Heresy right then and there if it had actually been a success. Imagine Horus trying to defeat the Imperium's armies if the Imperium's armies could pop up pretty much anywhere in the galaxy just like that. Oh, not quite that fast. Uh, warp travel, even in the webway, is not instantaneous, but it's a hell of a lot faster and a hell of a lot safer than using good old-fashioned warp travel. And with what the Emperor had planned, I think it probably would have ended the Horus Heresy almost immediately. Imagine entire legions of Custodes guards simply just appearing on any planet, anywhere, at any time, catching the rebels completely off guard and probably slaughtering them quite quickly. It would have been a very, very different civil war, but unfortunately these warnings came far, far too late. And hell, again, even if they had arrived a week earlier, this would be nothing more than the rantings and ravings of one old man, who many considered to be eccentric at best, batshit at worst, and Kaiser Lane, a disgraced astropath who couldn't even send or receive messages properly. I honestly don't know if it would have changed much, but it's uh, an interesting thing to think about nevertheless. And in this part in the book, Magnus makes his ever so brief and destructive appearance. Ah. Hashtag Magnus did absolutely do something, by the way. Magnus may not have wanted to do the horrible things and the destructive things that he did, but uh, his ego and lack of understanding of his own limitations, his complete and utter self-belief without really any basis for it, uh, well, that was definitely his fault. 
and the havoc wrecked upon the Astronomicon, the choir, the entire Earth, really, that too was his fault. Because when the Emperor's psychic wards collapsed deep beneath the palace, right before he managed to plug them up again with his own mind and sending his custodies into the gap to stop the demonic hordes from invading wholesale and sucking the entire planet into the warp, thousands died, either through nightmares being driven insane or by monsters stalking the night. Literal monsters. The Mind Hall too was much reduced, although Kaiser Lane, still alive, was imparted uh, yet another message, or perhaps more correctly, an interpretation by the choir mistress, who had seen the future after playing around with the warp a little bit too much. Though in her defence, she was caught unprepared at the focal point of a psychic maelstrom never before seen in well, human history, pretty much, so uh, I guess you can't really blame her too much for uh, being dragged along. But for Kai, now having been turned into the receptacle for this uh, message, the locked message, not available to the Imperial servants, although they really want to get at it, he is now the lockbox, and the Imperium, with its custodies, its specialists in mind break and other such wonderful things, they are the drill, which Kai will be exposed to <laughs> quite imminently. Poor bastard. You know, for the whole thing about the Argo, etc., you'd uh, think he'd be due for a little bit of a break, but uh, nope, nope, no. no, not in the slightest, actually. Though, in this particular instance, the Argo actually turns out to be a little bit of a benefit. In a somewhat roundabout way. We also get a quick look here at a group of prisoners. So, this wasn't at the beginning of the audiobook, but it was at the beginning of the actual book. Where a, a group of Astartes, the legionnaires that were stationed on Terra, not for like official military purposes, but for purposes of rest, recreation, studies, all manners of other things, were arrested by a group of specialists, along with a few thousand Imperial Army Reserve forces as well. These Astartes surrendered themselves to the Imperial forces. They were, um, I, I would say, probably outcasts. Now, obviously, the Imperium would have no choice but to arrest them, because they don't know that. <laughs> they could be spies for all they know. Obviously, they're gonna have to arrest them and lock them up in the absolute deepest, darkest hole that they have available to them. And one of these characters is actually one of my favorites in this uh, book, A Thousand Sun. He enters into a rather philosophical discussion with one of his custodies' captors, his jailer, about how he, as an individual, has not betrayed anyone. And whilst he sensed Magnus's arrival, I don't know if he quite understood what had just happened. He, he probably didn't. He probably assumed that this was some attempt by Magnus to bring a warning, although he probably would also know that this would be against the rulings of Nikea, of course. But he maintains his innocence that he is not a traitor, and he tries to make this point to the custodies, more for fun than the actual effect, I imagine, about how if you have a cancer, surely you just treat the cancer instead of killing the person. But uh, the Custodes is not overly impressed by this line of reasoning and simply tells the poor little thousand son to get fucked and eat his dinner. Some kind of sloppy, gooey, organic meal of questionable taste. Oh well, could be worse. He could have been an emperor's children. <laughs> you would really not have appreciated that kind of a treatment. We will be seeing more of these Astartes uh, in not too long, but for now all we get is this little tidbit here, showing them in their cells. But let's move on from the Space Marines, because they're not going to be players for a little while yet. How precisely, you may be asking, is the Argo, the massive, horrible ghost ship filled with the souls of the dead that is plaguing Kaiserland's mind, going to be of much, if indeed any, help? in resisting the psychic torture sessions that he is essentially going to be exposed to for quite some while now. Well, the thing is, to break the secrets out of Kai's mind, another psyker has to deep dive into his brain and try to extract them. 
If you have seen any science fiction movie ever, you will probably know that this is a far from harmless process, unfortunately. And she warns Zulane of this, saying that if he's cooperative, maybe she won't have to break every little piece of him. But in all your likelihood, a best case scenario, he's going to be a brain dead imbecile for the rest of his life, if he survives. Unfortunately for this psyker, whose task it is to break into Kai's mind, the choir master hid the secrets inside of the Argo. And well, again, the Argo is a ginormous screaming spaceship filled with the disembodied souls of the lost and the damned and various demonic presences. A uh, subterranean horror of the worst sort. <laughs> I mean, Kai, Kai probably isn't happy that that's where it's hidden, but uh, you gotta admit, if you're gonna have to hide something somewhere, a behemoth ghost ship covered in blood and teeth is probably one of the better hidey holes. And it proved very very effective. The two psychic specialists attempting to drill into Kai's mind got absolutely nowhere, until eventually after lengthy interrogation sessions that lasted for days, having tried everything from trickery to beguilement to outright threats and force, they eventually went for the nuclear option. The option in which uh, the odds of them actually retrieving the information was still minuscule, but Kaiser Lane would no longer be allowed to give anyone else the information either, as he would no doubt be reduced to nothing more than an empty scorched husk. But just as this final procedure was about to begin, one of the interrogators started acting very strangely. Kai noticed this because his body was being pumped full of stimulants rather than the usual sedatives. It turns out that Kai had an ally, an ally that he did not know of, but that knew of Kai. Although not having met him ever before, a third of her, the Thousand Sun Space Marine, kept imprisoned in the same facility that Kai knew that the astropath had something very, very, very valuable buried inside of his mind, and he was offended by the crude and simplistic attempts by the psychic experts to dig it out of Kai's mind, and so a third of her decided to intervene. He staged a breakout attempt for himself and a half of the so-called Crusader host, the space marines that had been arrested previously. This is a bit of an interesting thing, because to begin with, a third of us surrendered himself willingly. He didn't resist or anything like that. He even tried to talk a lot of his other brothers into surrendering, according to the book. Not all of them did, and uh, one of them, a word bearer, killed quite a lot of dudes before he was finally subdued. Why the custodies didn't simply just put a bolt round through the back of his head, God Emperor only knows, but hey, details. A third of her manages to psychically subvert several of his guards. There are only two custodies, and those two custodies are wounded. Those who are no longer fit for frontline service, so not the best the custodies have to offer, but even then, a subpar custody is usually a hell of a lot better than pretty much anything else in the galaxy. However, they are engaged in combat with their allies, who have been subverted by a third of us tricks, releasing the World Eater, who puts down the second Custodes. This, after having killed his two jailers and their immediate help, allows a third of her and half of the Crusader host to escape. A third of her simply just leaves the other half to their fate, death in all your likelihood. Which I also find interesting that the other Space Marines are go like, hold on a minute, maybe we should help them too? But maybe they didn't um, anticipate it, who knows. A third of her didn't free them, and what exactly happened to them is a little bit unclear. They may have been simply just murdered once the automated defenses came online, with a third of her managers to disengage by essentially 
doing a bit of warp trickery upon one of the dead bodies of the custodies, making the sentry guns recognize him as still alive, mimicking his voice and so on. It's not the most subtle breakout attempt I've ever read, but it certainly was interesting. Though, <laughs> it is entirely based upon one little thing. The custodians carry golden rings with advanced encryption mechanics inside of them that allows them to unlock any door. Alright. First and foremost, that's pretty retarded. And uh, a third of a comments on this that it spoke to the incredible arrogance of the custodians that they did not even consider that one of them could be killed and have their ring stolen. Which... Ah, oh God. We, we are approaching Aaron Dembski bowden levels of loyalist retardation here. I mean, I get the argument. The custodians, very proud and all that. Absolutely, certainly. But they are also people, they're individuals, who undergo constant blood games to eliminate any single goddamn security risk to the Emperor and to the palace in general. These absolute infiltration experts would carry around a skeleton key to every lock in the facility they are supposed to be guarding, would they? <laughs> oh, come on. Ah. Uh, uh. And the worst part is, it apparently is no way to override this skeleton key, and so, whilst the entire breakout attempt could have been stopped right then and there by a single person looking at them through a camera, for example, who simply goes like, Um, no, you're holding up the severed head of a custodian's guard? I, I don't think he's giving the orders anymore. Click, guns keep firing. Or somebody who just simply locks all of the doors and only opens them manually via, you know, recognizing people on a camera or something. It's, mm, it's really annoying. And also, by the way, they let aircraft land at the facility and stay there whilst there is an active breakout with a half dozen legionnaires. They, 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 they don't go like, okay, right. We can't lock the doors because of retardation. We can't stop them because fucking Legionis Astartes. All of the custodians are off to kill Magnus, which also is an interesting thing. They must have left like days ago. And all of them? Really? Okay. Well, I mean, at least they left two, I suppose. Two wounded ones, but all right. I, I can kind of buy that. And then they go, like, hey, hey, you, watch, watch, officer. We've got aircraft just chilling in the hangars, and the legionnaires are basically, you know, a stone's throw away, and they can unlock the doors. Should we maybe order them to, uh, fuck off? <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's an Adeptus, uh, it, it's, it's an Adeptus Mechanicus vessel, <laughs> don't you know? We can't order those about, and logic don't work on the, the oh, god damn it. Mm. Such things frustrate me. Such things frustrate me greatly. Why does loyalists always have to appear like such complete fucking retards? See, the Battle of Istwad I really enjoyed because there was no real way for the loyalists to know that Horus had subverted the other legions. And there wasn't even any reason for them to to entertain the idea because it had been so thoroughly established in the previous books that the, the, the very notion of Astartes turning on Astartes was, was alien, was absurd, was ridiculous. And Dawn even took some precautions. When um, the Night Lords, for example, were called, Dawn asked that Conrad would be, uh, was to not be informed, and that only the closest elements of the Night Lords legions would actually be called to reinforce the expedition fleet. But he made this a secret order, because he didn't want it to get out what had happened between him and Conrad Curse. He clearly had his suspicions, but he needed at this point, you know, every bit of force he possibly could muster. You could certainly argue that calling in the Night Lords at all was still a bit of a gamble, certainly, but in the end, Curse shows up with his full force, and since Dawn didn't want to, again, because it, to him it seems ridiculous to entertain the notion, it, you need to understand the mental blow to the Imperium to have the impossible happen, and if the impossible has happened, it gets a lot more difficult to truly, you know, stand back and have a cold, level-headed appreciation of everything that's going on. But still, that was a trap well laid, but 
God, there are too many instances of the loyalists just being goddamn morons, and the custodies in particular. <laughs> Why does everybody keep picking on the custodies? I mean, don't get me wrong, I hate the fact that they're an army now because their fucking stat lines are a joke. But I like the Custodes. They're big and cool and golden and awesome and imposing, so why do they off always have to be the dum-dums? <sighs> anyway, let's wrap up part one there, and then we can start afresh on the next episode, having overcome this... Yeah, <sighs> retardation. Yes, that seems like a good idea. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening. And as usual, the next episode will be up tomorrow. Unless I fuck up the upload or something, which... Is for some reason, YouTube is being really sketchy with me as of late, so I figured I'd mention the possibility. Have a good day.